Hello, my name is Robert Gregory. I'm the Public Affairs Director with the Australian Jewish Association. This interview is about a significant topic that many may not be aware of, the theft of the Chabad Rebbe's library by Russia. The Chabad movement and its Rebbe have had a major impact on the Jewish world. This includes Australia's Jewish community, including me. Many Australian Jews attend Chabad houses or synagogues with Chabad rabbis, and at the AJA we have many members in the Chabad community. My guest today, Stephen Liebman, is a lawyer with Rothwell Fig and is representing the Chabad movement as it seeks to reclaim this important Jewish collection from Russia. Thank you for joining the AJA today, Stephen. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me on, Robert. So could you start by telling us a bit about the Rebbe's Library? Why is it significant and what's its history? Sure. We normally refer to the, the materials at issue as the Schneerson Collection. They consist of two parts. First, uh, the Schneerson Library. And this is a collection of materials dating back to 1772. It contains more than 12,000 books and hundreds of manuscripts of the first five Chabad Rebbe's. Uh, that collection contains not only their personal copies of books, but their handwritten notes on volumes, materials that the first five Rebbe's wrote themselves. Um, those materials were seized uh, during the Bolshevik Revolution uh, by the Soviet Union back in 1917-1918. Um, this was a time period when the practice of Judaism was prohibited in Russia. And in fact, the sixth Chabad Rebbe was sentenced to death by the Soviets in 1927 for teaching Judaism before he was allowed to escape to Latvia. In any event, they seized the, the Schneerson Library during the Bolshevik Revolution, and they've held on to it ever since. The second part of the Schneerson collection um, is uh, about 25,000 pages of handwritten materials, uh, written mostly by the Chabad Rebbe's, uh, their teachings, their correspondence, and other records. Uh, those materials were seized from Chabad in 1939 by the Nazis after the onset of the Second World War. Um, the Nazis, and this this sounds like it comes out of a movie. Uh, it doesn't, but it's in some ways a lot stranger than what you might see in a in a movie. The collection was taken by the Gestapo to a Gestapo-controlled castle in Germany, and it was held there during the Second World War. Um, at the end of the war, the Soviet Red Army captured the castle uh, and captured the the Chabad archives, the Schneerson archives. But rather than returning them to Chabad, they took them back to Russia, claiming that they were war booty and the property of the Soviet people. Um, and both the library and the archives have been imprisoned in Russia um, you know, since then. It's incredible. I mean, it sounds like such an important uh, Jewish historical um, and religious uh, artifact. So what has Chabad done so far to try and reclaim the library? Right. Well, the efforts to get the the the, uh, the collection back date from the very time that they were stolen. The has been working almost for 100 years to get the materials back. But uh, in recent time periods, I would say there were two phases. First, there were efforts to use the Russian court system to get the to get the, uh, the collection back. And in fact, Chabad obtained favorable rulings first from Mikhail Gor Gorbachev who ordered that the collection be returned to Chabad, and then an arbitration panel in, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, unfortunately, in 1992, when the Russian government collapsed and the, the Russian Federation came into being, there was a band of anti-Semitic hooligans who physically prevented the return of the materials to Chabad. The materials were then you know, sort of re-seized by the Russian Federation and have been kept in Russia ever since then. Um, knowing that we really had no recourse, no further recourse in the Russian courts, Chabad started a lawsuit in the United States in 2004. Uh, since then, the U.S. courts have, in Russia, opposed the lawsuit. They opposed on the merits. They came into court and they disputed Chabad's claim. They said these materials were the patrimony of the Russian people. They were not um, the property of Chabad. And they lost on the merits. They lost in the trial court. They lost in the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, 
And after they lost on the merits, they took their ball and they went home. They said, we're not playing anymore. Um, so we have a court ruling in the United States ordering Russia to return the books. Russia has failed to do that. The court has been imposing sanctions, which now total, I believe, $170 million and increased by $50,000 a day for every day that they don't return the books. But of course, the question is, how do you put pressure on Russia? Obama doesn't have an army, at least not an army with, you know, with tanks and planes. So what we've been doing is we've been going around the United States and we're looking around the world for assets that belong to the Russian Federation that we can seize to satisfy the judgment. Not because Chabad wants the money, um, but because this will be a pressure point to try to convince the Russian Federation to trade whatever assets we can seize for the books that rightfully belong to Chabad. It sounds like a really good strategy. Um, I'm just wondering why won't Russia give the books back? It seems seems a bit like a no-brainer. Yeah. We don't know the answer to that question. We, we've been asking that question since the first, our firm's been asking that question since the first time we got involved in the case. And Chabad's been asking itself that question for decades. And we just don't know the answer. I mean, decisions in Russia are made from the very top. Like Vladimir Putin, we don't know why he won't, won't give the books back. We've engaged in negotiations with Russia. The State Department has engaged in negotiations with Russia. Um, we have the various court rulings. Um, uh, but the bottom line is, they've essentially said to us, if you don't have an army where you can come and seize the books, we're not giving them back. So we're trying to apply as much pressure as we possibly can to the Russian Federation in the United States and in other places around the world. And that, that sort of leads me into my next question. Um, I heard there's been a new development in Israel. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. For a number of years, the Russian Federation has um, requested the transfer of a compound, a property in Jerusalem called the Alexander Compound that has the Alexander Nevsky Church in it. Um, they want that compound transferred to the Russian Federation. It's ownership. I believe is currently with um, uh, predecessors of the Russian Federation, or, or, um, uh, but not with the Russian Federation. And the Israeli government has gotten involved in the issue because Russia has said it's it's important for them. Um, what we have done recently through Chabad's Israeli lawyers is filed a request with the government that the government not agree to the transfer of the property. For the Russian Federation, unless and until Russia returns the Schneerson collection. Chabad doesn't want the church. It's not trying to obstruct the transfer of the church. Chabad is just trying to apply another point of pressure on the Russian Federation to make Russia do the right thing, to make them comply with their obligations under international law, to make them do what's moral and just. Um, you know, there's a teaching in the Talmud that I think is very familiar to, to a broad range of people, that there's always an obligation to redeem captives, that you're supposed to do whatever you can within certain limits to obtain the release of, of, of Jewish captives, and also non-Jewish captives. Um, here, Chabad views these, these books, these manuscripts, which contain the writings and the thinkings, the thoughts of of the first five Chabad Rebbe's as akin to uh, captives. The books have souls and those souls are in prison. The books are in prison. The souls of the Rebbe's are in a way imprisoned with the books and we have an obligation to free them. So we're doing whatever we can in the United States and around the world to apply pressure to Russia to return the books. And let me be very clear, the $170 million in damages, the Alexander Nevsky Church, Anything else that that we can seize or or or, or block the transfer of to Russia, all of that we're willing to give up in return for the Schneerson collection. We just want the books back. In fact, there's a room ready for them at Chabad's headquarters at 770 Eastern Parkway. It's been constructed. I've seen it. I've been there. Um, it is just waiting for the, the library and the archives to come home. Wow. Well. Is there anything um, in the international Jewish world we can do to help? Sure, I would say two things. One is 
to the extent that the Australian Jewish community has any influence either on the Russian government directly or on Australian policy with respect to Russia, please try to use it to, to, to have the Australian government convey to Russia how important it is to, to the Australian government that Russia returns these books. Second, and uh, maybe I should set up a 1-800 toll-free line, um, if you know of assets in Australia of the Russian government um, that are not embassies, that are not, uh, uh, you know, that are, that are things that we can seize to try to put pressure on the Russian government to return the books, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, we're, we're happy to expand the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the scope of the pressure uh, to, uh, to Australia uh, to try to get the uh, Schneerson collection back. Yeah, it's a great idea and we'd be very happy to pass on any tip-offs if anyone wants to go through us. I think that's that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Stephen. Uh, we're going to watch the case very closely and obviously we're praying for, for a victory. So thank you again and, and good luck. We hope it ends well. Thank you, Robert. Take care.